everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Jaren Cho. Jaren began training in Taekwondo at age six, switching to Wing Chun and Yang style Tai Chi Chuan at age 13. This was followed by training in Liang Yi Chuan and Shaolin Kung Fu. His studies led him to Montreal, where he trained in Xing and Bagua with Master Yang Hai, also known in the West as Hai Yang, and he became Hai Yang's first formal disciple. Jaren now resides in Hong Kong, using his knowledge as a sports and orthopedic physical therapist to make traditional ideas more easily understandable and accessible. Jaren is also the newest member of the Dowie team. He is our community outreach representative for Asia, which means that he and I will be collaborating together in the near future on interviews. And hopefully at some point in the near future, he will be hosting some of these podcast episodes. Jaren, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. So let's get started at the beginning. Um, you said you started Taekwondo at six. That sounds like it may have been your parents' idea. Was Do you come yeah, from a martial arts family? Uh, do I come from a martial arts family? No, uh, kind of. No, not really. Not from my parents, because my Wing Chun teacher is my uncle. Ah. Yeah, so that's a long story, too. I started Taekwondo because, um, not because I was getting beat up in nursery school or anything like that, but because um, my parents wanted to me to send me out to some some sports, uh, I I was running around too much, so they sent me out to I think it was swimming, basketball, taekwondo, and all that, and I just ended up liking taekwondo a lot more. That's how I started with taekwondo. And you continued that until you were in your early teens. What made you switch to Wing Chun? That's a quite a leap. No, I continued till my late teens. So okay. so what's funny is started with taekwondo. Everybody does some kind of sport or martial arts. People do karate. Uh, taekwondo in, in Hong Kong. Not as many people do Kung Fu, though, because um, I was I was born in Hong Kong, and then I moved to Canada when I was about two, and then moved back in my early teens. Um, so when I was in Canada and when I was first in Hong Kong, I started with Taekwondo. Um, I liked it a lot. Um, I thought I was super good at kicking, being, you know, early teens. And um, I used to have some bro Kung Fu brothers who, no, not Kung Fu brothers, Taekwondo brothers who, who would train together with the team. But uh, anyways, I always watched those Kung Fu movies because when I was in Canada, uh, they always played movies and TV shows that were a bit older than what was happening in Hong Kong because uh, there was no internet. Uh, there was, there, there was um, you had to go to, I think it was Blockbuster yeah. to get recordings or, or, or Chinatown, right? right? So anyways, my parents played those. I, I was during the VHS tape period, plays those, those tapes for us and me and my brother i have a younger brother would always go out and fight in the backyard yeah but anyways um i i started when i came back to hong kong i think um because there were still video arcades in hong kong do you know video arcades the, yeah yeah of course people listening in probably won't know but <laughs> but um we got into a fight in a video arcade and my my friend was better than me he was about four years older and and we decided to try kicking in a video arcade. And he, he pulled off one of the newest. Oh, let's rewind a bit. Uh, back when I was learning Taekwondo, I would call it semi old school Taekwondo because um, it wasn't the same type of Taekwondo as it was in the 80s or the 90s, but it wasn't the type of Taekwondo we have now, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there were still some kind of old school techniques, but but we weren't all fancy. Anyways, the 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 fanciest technique that we had was a three sixty, uh, turning kick or roundhouse kick. So he tried to pull that off. It was pretty until he kicked the the game thing. Yeah. His <laughs> his shin hit the uh, arcade uh, console thing, and he was in tears because it was so painful. And I had to like drag him away. We lost that fight, obviously. And then at that point, I was just like, I can't, I can't kick, I can't kick anymore. So I decided to learn Chinese Kung Fu being back in Hong Kong. And um, my mom being a mom, she would be worried that if I learned Kung Fu, I would get kicked into a triad in Hong Kong. Because in Hong Kong, back in those days, it was still very common for Chinese martial arts to be associated with um, gang members or triads. It isn't like the case now. It, uh, we moved out of that during my time. So I'm not, but, um, but yeah. not involved in organized crime. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, but so we were looking around and my mom wasn't very, uh, she was kind of worried that that would happen. Right. So 
we looked around a couple of schools. I didn't like them. And then she said, oh, wait, I, I remember. Um, uh, my grandfather passed away. Uh, and we met my uncle at the funeral. And then my other uncle uh, used to train with him like 30 years ago. He stopped teaching for 30 years. And he was, uh, my mom was say, oh, why don't you teach my sons? Uh, he wants to do Kung Fu. And then eventually I started learning from my first uh, teacher, my Wing Chun teacher, Sifu Sam Lao, who is a student of Yip Man. Wow. And that's how I started with my Wing Chun. And then let's, let's shorten this story down a bit. Uh, uh, so, so I thought I was good at uh, kicking and then I got some hands and then I thought, I want to learn some cool movie stuff. And, and I wanted to learn Tai Chi and stuff like that because I wanted to fling people around and, and all that. And I was looking, I, I went to a couple of teachers. I wasn't too satisfied because back, back then I always wanted to fight. I, I thought practical use was the only use of Chinese martial arts. So I would look to see how I could use it. Anything that was useless, I would say it's useless. But anyways, I found a couple of Tai Chi teachers that didn't like it until one day the same the same Taekwondo brother came back to training. He said, like, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, did you know that you can fight with Tai Chi? <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I don't think so, but I want to. And then he pulls up his, his, um, dope, his, his pants and shows me like a giant lump on his shin, his shin again. And uh, he's like, <laughs> yeah, I met a, a Tai Chi guy and then he knew I was Hong Kong champion. He told me to fight him a bit. And so I kicked him and then he, he now I know this as um ticking or intercepting power. And, and he basically just did that and blocked the kick while it was, because we were dumb. We were dumb kids. You tell us to kick you, we're going to kick you in the head, right? Okay. We're not going to kick you, we're not going to kick you in the face. And he tried to kick him in the head and um, he ended up with a lump. So I went to find him. And um, so eventually his teacher uh, which was, which is my Si Hing teacher. So uh, how should I put this? You know how the names are pretty complicated, right? <laughs> so he learned from my Kung Fu uncle, who after seeing me, he's like, oh, you're so tall, I'll send you to an expert, and then sends me to my Sifu. Uh, so my Sifu is the Kung Fu brother of his teacher. But anyways, he's a uh, uh, law enforcement. So I had interesting um, learning from him. So he is my Tai Chi teacher, uh, Ho Pui Lam, Ho Pui Lam. And he is a Kung Fu brother of, um, do you know Doc Fai Wong? Of course, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, they're Kung Fu brothers, but they only o overlap for a little bit because Doc Fai Wong was um, based in America. Right. right. They send the teachers, but my, my Tai Chi teacher also, uh, since childhood, trained um, Trolley Foot and Eagle Claw. So I, I picked up some of that from him too. So at this point, I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm good. I could kick, I could punch. Uh, what should I do? I need to learn how to generate power really well. And it was in 2003 when there was SARS in Hong Kong. And um, the Hong Kong government invited some Shaolin monks to Hong Kong to teach in each district. Uh, they're they're uh, Yi Jin Jing. Yeah. Uh, you know, the bone well, marrow. And then changing. Yeah. So anyways, uh, a Qigong set, and it was summertime. I was doing all that Kung Fu, Taekwondo, and I was starting um, submission grappling then as well. That's another story. Uh, oh, and they came, and they were going to teach for a couple months. In we, we used to have these um, indoor games, sports centers, in each district in Hong Kong. And then they put, I don't know, 18 monks, one in each district, and you had to pick out of a lottery. Like you had to draw for your, your place. My mom was just like, oh, you like Kung Fu? She didn't tell me. She, so she placed um, uh, our names into, say, three districts that was close to home. And then somehow me and my brother both got a slot. So say my brother got Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I got Tuesday, Thursday. Um, I went to the Tuesday, Thursday one. And then I was just like, hey, you know, I have morning Tai Chi class on this day. So can I swap with my brother? And then I swap places with my brother. But but they're, they don't know each other. But right. they were the same organizer, and they were just like, yeah, let's, uh, sure, if you show us that you got places, right? So somehow I met my fourth teacher because I had, it's a long story, right? <laughs> so I had um, summer morning training with another Sifu, and, just, and somehow I had to switch. My brother got the same place, and then we switched, and then I met my monk teacher now. And, and so I met him, 
which was uh, he was a Shaolin monk. Uh, and the first lesson, I I start training and I go up to him after class. He's like, I'm like, oh Sifu Sifu, um, is there a Faji movement? And you think it's always there in in the movies? And then he looks at me. He's like, do you want to learn how to fight? And I'm just like, no no no, I just want to learn. <laughs> I just want to learn. And he's like, oh, come find me. It's our first time in Hong Kong. Uh, come find me. Me and my brothers are living here. Uh, and he lived with two Kung Fu brothers then in Hong Kong. And, and so I did. And it's funny because um, I, 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 I go up to his place and then suddenly he and his uh, older Kung Fu brother meet me and the, the Kung Fu brother pats me down and looks at me. He's like, ah, this one's okay. This one's okay. And then they go into a room and, and, and just disappear for like an hour or something. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, what's happening? What's happening? <laughs> and then they come out and then they decided like uh they, they come out and they're like, okay, we need to we need you to ask your parents. I'm like, ask them what? Okay, we decided that it's fate. Um you were the first suitable age person to come ask us to teach, and it's our first time in Hong Kong. We're looking for a disciple and you're looking for a teacher. So it's fate. Uh, we will teach you, but we need your parents' permission. And we will teach you anything you want. And then they start they start list, listing out the things that they know that we know the qigong, we know the forms, we know the sanda. Uh, but we also have some family styles that we train. Uh, what do you want to train? And then I'll be like, I don't know, everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there, there was also a thing they could do, that, which was more like, a, I'm going to use a different name. It's gonna, it's more like a penetrating strike thing. So then, oh, we also know this. And then he's like, okay, hit me. And then he hits me. And then I started like, I spasm and I'm like curling on the ground. And then he smacks me in the back and I feel better. But anyways, let's just say, yeah, let's just say it's like a penetrating strike, like a deep internal strike from their full family. And then it's more like a, a wave releasing spasm. Wow. But that's all I would call it, right? For now. Okay. Uh, but um, yeah, that's how I started learning from him. And so this was my my training in Hong Kong. It was, it was a, a series of funny events that led me to le learning from a bunch of teachers. <laughs> Um, uh, halfway through, I also started learning uh, MMA and grappling because of, of friends in in uh, in school. But that's that's I'll, I'll just talk about Chinese martial arts for now, and that's that. And then I went to Canada for university at uh, McGill in Montreal, and that's where I met Sifu Haiyan. And let's just stop there for now. I'll okay, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll get to we'll get to that in just a second. Um... So I, you know, a lot of us, when we start out training in one style or another, you know, there's this um, tendency to say, okay, like I, I used to study Wing Chun also. I, I went from studying a, sort of a family style Shaolin to studying Wing Chun and I found Wing Chun to be, you know, very effective. Uh, it was something that I could see the combat effectiveness of or the fighting effectiveness of. So for, for myself, and I think for a lot of guys in America, my age, we were like, now this is the thing, you know, and then, um, MMA came around and we we're like, now this is the thing. And then as you get older, you start to, you know, it, it takes some of us, myself included, a long time to see that all of these things are related. Um, it seems like you from a very early age sort of intuitively figured that out. Would you say that's fair to say that, that there was something of value in all of these martial arts? It was more the methodology of training than it was the art itself that gave it value? I think I was lucky because my teachers were all very rare and very good. Yeah. Um, I, I I grew up in the the martial arts circle in Hong Kong. I've seen I see so many teachers. Uh, they were all very. The, 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 I was lucky because the teachers I had were all very good, and um, they were able to do what I expected them them to be able to do in the martial art. And and so I I also kept an open mind. Uh, a lot of people when they learn multiple martial arts, they they end up going comparing each style. Right. right. Right, because they feel like, oh, if you punch me here, I'll kick you there. If you kick me there, I'll punch you there. I, I was more of the style of, of, oh, this style has this. This style specializes in this. Uh, this style might have it, but it doesn't specialize in this. And I lack this, and I lack this. So I'm going to listen to what the teachers say and just do that style. So I, I put them together like that. But I was also able to separate them very early on. Yeah. So you had good teachers, but you were also a good student, I think. Okay. So... You you ended up in Canada and and you met uh, Master Young. Um, how, how exactly did can you describe your first meeting with him? How did you find out about him? It was YouTube. I was trying to. Me too. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I I being being I think it was seventeen then 
ish. Okay. Um, is university right? Right. So being around eighteen, I I've uh, trained for about ten years already, right? I've been in my fair number of competitions and and fights, but so I was still looking for the practical stuff. I wanted to find somebody who could really do what they can. I I looked at a, a bunch of schools in Montreal. I wasn't too satisfied. I actually was starting to teach in, at McGill. One of those, um, I was going to start teaching Wing Chun in McGill. Okay. And I've also always wanted to learn uh, Xing Yi or Ba Ji, uh, but I couldn't find any. And there was no Xing Yi in Hong Kong. But anyways, I visited a couple of teachers. One, one was, let's not mention names in Montreal. Anyways, okay. uh, yeah, I, I looked at a couple and then I finally decided that uh, Sifu was uh, someone that I could learn a lot from. And it was funny because I didn't know at the time. I knew he was good, but I didn't know he was that good. Uh, yeah, yeah, because because it's it's easy to look good. It's it's harder to have a deep understanding, and even harder to be able to look at a person and be able to give them tips that would actually help them level up. I, I had a fair amount of training. I I considered myself good, but looking back, I'd be like, I know you're rubbish, right? But um. So, so I had a bit of an ego back then. I'd be like, ah, I have to find a teacher who's worth my time. And uh, fortunately, he was. Yeah. And, um, he, he has a very deep understanding of the internal martial arts, and he, he could put things to use. And that's how I started learning from him. But, but my first class was, was just like any other normal class. He treated everybody uh, the same when you first meet him because he doesn't want to waste his time. Right. He's... It's it's fair, right? You're you're a, you're a teacher. You don't want to waste your time. You've seen so many people, so I started learning in his group classes, and then after a bit of time, I asked him if I could learn with him privately, and I started doing that too. That's that. What would you say that a typical training session with him was like in those days, as far as the group classes were concerned? Oh, it was it was easy. There was a warm up, and then um, we would do a bit of Zhan Zhuang, but we don't emphasize a lot of that. We uh, do a couple minutes of it, but we also do half an hour of say Pi Chuan or Bung Chuan uh, in Qi. And we, the first couple rows are always semi-standing. So you would hold a position, uh, move on to the next one and then hold it again. And then move on to the next one and hold it again. And then that would go on for like 20, 30 minutes. And then there would be the form of the day and then applications. Did he correct you much when you were doing sort of the semi-standing um... We, mm -hmm. uh, we finish warm up and then we stand in Santi to wait for him. And right. He has a bit of, and he comes over and corrects everybody a bit. And then he goes, Oh, go. And then we go. Yeah. It was, it's a different experience teaching from um, each teacher, uh, learning from each teacher because they've all got their own styles, right? Uh, some of my teachers were very hands on. Some of them, well, all of my teachers were very hands on. Uh, but some of them like taught you one thing and you went went back and trained it for an hour and then he'd look at you and then some just like to play themselves. Like my Tai Chi teacher, he basically just wanted to train himself as well. Right. So we did. Right. And did he um, have you, uh, did Master Young have you guys uh, spar against each other from the beginning as well? Did that for a bit. We did that for a bit. We also did two person practices for a bit too. Yeah. yeah two man sets and things like that uh, yeah 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 and, yeah and mostly single applications as well because every time he shows a form he would always show its function yeah yeah back when i first became aware of him which was you know many years ago his, his youtube channel was just sort of like um demonstrations for the most part and then there were short videos of him teaching and things like that not not like what he does now where he's you know so in depth you know the videos that he's putting out now and um uh, i was really pleased and surprised when he started making videos like that because his teaching is so in-depth um it, there's so much material that for for me at least it's it's hard to digest it all um yeah it's 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 good because he's he's very well educated yeah he, yeah because i think he has two or three degrees i can't i can't even remember <laughs> anyways he's um He's very well educated. He understands Chinese culture very well. He understands Chinese language very well. He understands yeah. martial arts very well. And so he mixes the three together. It's almost like I, I, I do another, I'm trying to do another version of what he does. 
uh, because he does the traditional stuff and I do the sports medicine stuff. And I, I, I try to make traditional things more understandable and systematic. So, so the training is more effective. That's so it's, 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 um, I was inspired. Yeah. Systematic is a good word for it. It's very systematic, very thorough. Did you uh, study Bagua simultaneously with the Xing Yi from the beginning or was that something that came about later? I started Xing Yi first and then I decided I wanted to learn as much as I can from him. So I did Bagua. So I did the Xing Yi classes, the Bagua classes and the, the privates with him to see how much I can pick up. So when you started doing your um, private lessons with him, how, how did your how did your actual formal discipleship come about? How far into your teaching with him or learning from him were you when that uh, came about? Discipleship? Oh, it, it went in very long because it's funny. When I first started learning from him, I'm actually older now than he was then when wow. I first started. Learning. Yeah, we're, we're 15 years apart. Hmm. So he was in his 30s, I think early 30s when I first started learning from him. And uh, before I left Montreal, which is about maybe five years into learning from him. I've been doing this very intensively for five years. Uh, I just like, are you going to take a disciple? He's like, no, no, I'm too young. I'm too young to take a disciple. I'm just like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> and um, I continuously flew back and forth between Hong Kong and Canada. And I think he's corrected my system. My, my, every time I go to him, he looks at the whole system that I've learned from him, right? He's corrected me systematically at least three, maybe more times. And then finally, the last trip I went, he's uh, he's like, okay, I, I I never I didn't ask him before I flew flew in. And then finally, having tea and chatting to him, I'm like, oh, Sifu, have you taken any disciples yet? And he's like, oh, no, not yet. I'm gonna take you as the first one this time. And so and so we did that. Yeah. What did that mean to you? It meant a lot. It meant a lot. Um, people, when I tell people, it's different. It, it, uh, indoor discipleship is is a relationship, right? I I'm actually quite experienced in becoming an indoor disciple. I'm the indoor disciple of like eight teachers, uh, and um, people make it sound like. Now sometimes when I tell people that they think I'm just shopping around, but I'm not. I I only become an indoor disciple when the teacher thinks I'm good at the style, or I only become. I only say I know the style if I think I'm decent enough for me not to bring shame to the family. <laughs> right. It, it's not like I learned, I, I, I learned a, a lot of other things too. And I don't claim I'm good at any of them. I don't claim I'm good at any of the stuff I claim I'm good at now, but, but, um, but I just mentioned things that I can actually do like for, for I, for my Instagram account, I only talk about Wing Chun, Xing Yi, Liang Yi, and some, some, some uh, Wing Chun. And it's because I could actually move, the way I'm intended to in those stuff. But anyways, what's it like? It meant a lot. Uh, it's it's a relationship. People people don't understand as much in 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 the West, but it's a uh, it's it's interesting. But it's also a, a funny topic because in Hong Kong and in mainland China, there's a lot of discipleship ceremonies going on now. Yeah. It's uh, it's it, it's different every time. It's different with every teacher. But most important is the relationship you have with the teacher. Like uh, a couple of teachers I have in Hong Kong, they're like my father to me. Yeah. Yeah. And he speaks very highly of you. So I think it meant a lot to him as well. Um, something the, the first time I saw you, um, I think was on his channel doing Shu uh, Dian's style. Shang Xing Shu. Forgive my horrible pronunciation, but... Um, could you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about Shu Dian, like your understanding of him and what he did for the art of Xing Yi? Oh, so the secrets have to come out now, huh? Well, they don't have to be secrets. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You, you might be new to some of our audience. <laughs> so um, the Xing Yi I learned from Master Yang Hai comes from uh, three branches. So uh, his grandfather taught him the Zhang uh, Dong style, and he his grandfather was also a uh, a, a friend of friends of Li Chunyi. So we do Zhang Dong, Li Chunyi, and Xue Dian style. Uh, Xue Dian style is is a lot of more a lot more coiling and a, a, a lot of coiling and uncoiling in the body, and the body is a lot more flexible that compared to other styles. I'm not saying again that other styles don't have it, but it's one of its main focuses. Right. Um, other styles might focus on different types of powers. Uh, some, some might focus on really vertical uh, direct power. Some might 
do more horizontal power. Even even the the santis of of the three styles that we've done are slightly different. Like some would be like really high up, some would be really down, some would be more horizontal. Shredians is more twisted, and the body itself moves a lot. So so I actually picked up a lot of the shenfa from internal styles from Sifu from from Yang Haiyan because um I could kind of like oh no no it's funny. I was probably not ready for it when I left for university. I was still 17. So I, I learned from, from Ayan Sifu. I go back to my Tai Chi teacher. I'm like, oh, I learned Xing Yi. I finally know about the Kwa. And he, and then Sifu's like, what, you mean this? And then he does it. I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, anyways, uh, the Sri Dian style is um, a crisper power. And it's very systematic. Um, so there's the five elements, and then there's the 12 animals, right? But because... Uh, I don't know if people are gonna not like me for this because because I think Shredin was somewhat of a genius. He noticed things that, how should I put it, weren't normally the main focus of main, mainstream Shingi styles. So he took them out and maybe put them into Xiangxing Shu. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what Xiangxing Shu is, if the, the, Nobody knows about it. It's they they, they all. It, it's all very mystical, but it's not what I view it as. It's a set of accessory exercises or or movements that focus on things that the normal shi uh, practitioner doesn't focus on as much. I'm I'm not saying it, they're not good at it. I'm just saying if you compare tan to it, uh, tan to it versus xing yi, tan to would have more more focused lower body training right is, is that fair? yeah that's sure. a fair statement, right? i i i don't want to claim that tanto is better at kicking than shingy because some shingy guys are gonna be like oh have you seen the dragon style the dragon form and the swallow form we train are like i know we do we do a thai boxer trains boxing too but the boxer is always better at boxing than thai boxing right you, you know what i mean so he puts things that are harder to train in shingy and he separates them and puts them into xiang xing shu and and so Xiang Xing Shu is mainly uh, Wu Fa Ba Xiang, which is the five methods and the eight images. So the uh, much with the five elements, which is in Xing Yi, the five uh, the five ways of generating power, the five Wu Fa or five body methods, or, or five ways of say moving your body to gen or if you generate power too, but you twist your body so much. That it's it's after you do it, the normal five elements is a lot easier. So that's what I meant by emphasizing particular parts of a system in Xiang Xing Shu so that it improves uh Xing Yi. And and then that's the Xiang Xing Shu method. That's a great explanation. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's funny though, because people always think that you train the whole thing for your whole life. Say people always talk about how five elements is 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 um something you train for your whole life, which is true. Yeah. People think uh Xilin Tao or Xilin Tao is what you do for your whole life, which is true. And then say if you do say Hakka style, say the Sambo, you know, the San Chin is something you do yeah. for your whole life. It is true, but it's not as simple. Um another thing people do is um they talk about old grandmasters and they say, Oh, he only used the Pichuan, he only uses the Pichuan, or, or Guo Yunshan, he only uses the Beng Chuan the, to fight. But it's not that simple. When a guy only uses one move to fight, it means he could use that move as a thousand moves. He could use it in 10,000 different situations. He could use that in 10,000 different ways of generating power, but it just looks the same. So um, it, you get what I mean? Yeah, so in, 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 um, in Tongbei, a lot of people say, oh, my teacher only used a pijang. I, I don't do tongue. Uh, uh, I use a pijang. And, and the guy collapsed. He only uses pijang in every single situation. But then uh, after speaking to some, um, I was recently in Beijing, uh, uh, deep uh, tongue teachers, they're like, ah, don't be an idiot. We could have five powers in the same pijang. It's different every time. Yeah. Uh, so it's the same in Xing Yi. And, and say all that. It's we, we, we ha You have to go the full circle for the main thing, the basics to be deep. So people always say the main, say five elements is the alphabet of the system. Without it, you won't be able to get good. You won't understand English at all. But if you don't train all the other stuff, you've just got a jumble of words, right? So you need to train the alphabet 
you have the words, sentences, and then eventually when you're good, you write paragraphs and then you, I don't know, move on to poetry. And then you go back and say, hey, look, it came out from this. But if you only had this, you're only at kindergarten level. So it's the same with, um, say, let's go back to Xing Yi. So you start the five elements. Your power is very, very crude. Um, it's very rough. It might, you might get strong, right? But if you only do the five elements, you'll only be at this level. And then you do 12 animals. You free up your body in different ways. And then, oh, you go back to the five elements. And suddenly you realize your 12 animals are in the five elements. Yeah, absolutely. And then eventually you do Xiang Xing Shu, which is a set of exercises. It's only secret because it's a method. The method to becoming good is the secret of martial arts. I, I don't think there's a secret technique, but the way you train, the way you get there, and the way you train for it to, to be able to be used is the secret. There's no like secret move. It's how to train. But anyways, you go to Xiang Xing Shu. Oh, you free up your body even more. And then you go back to your elements and you realize, oh, wow. So I'm putting this back into the book and this book gets this much better. And that's why you train this, the five elements or, 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 or San Chin for life. And that's, I think, what most people mean. And, and when people think about advanced sets, they get confused. The advanced sets inspire you so your basics get better and your basics improve your advanced sets. And I don't know how I got into the topic, but yes. No, it's a great explanation. That's exactly what I, what I was looking for. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so while you were training with him, you trained Bagua and Shini, did you study, um, Naden or uh, Shudao with him at all? Also any meditation? Yeah, I couldn't sit still. Hmm? I was young. I couldn't sit still. Couldn't sit still. No, I still have that problem. <laughs> so you were in Canada for how long? I think five years from it. Five, degree. five yeah. years. And then you moved back to Hong Kong. Is that right? And, and yeah. so. Uh, what is your martial arts practice like there now? Are you teaching now? I'm kind of teaching, yeah. I, I teach mostly because I want to play. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I do have a, a day job, right? So I'm like one of those old old, old um, martial arts stories. I, I, break, I fix people during the day and I break people at night. <laughs> yeah. Repeat business, repeat customers. So I don't I don't teach full time. I'm, I'm also very picky because... Yeah. Initially, I started teaching because people asked me to, and I wanted to train more. And um, I, I wanted to find people who were, who wanted to train hard. And, and uh, because we get hit a lot when we train, right? Because we, most of the time during training is uh, I, partner training. We, we would fight, we would chase out, we would push hands, we would throw, we would fight. Yeah. I needed to find people who were okay with hitting and getting hit and not getting pissed off at each other. That's right. very hard to find in Chinese martial arts circles. Yeah. It's okay if you're in, say, a boxing school or, say, a judo throw, uh, a judo school. I I, oh, I also didn't mention that I I, I still do judo competitively oh. right now. I still compete in, in the Hong Kong Open. I still fight. But I, I recently torn my second ACL, so I had to take a break. But anyways, I really like... Uh, the practical aspect and and so I wanted to find people who were okay with fighting with each other and not getting angry about it and so I keep the group quite small so it's, it's uh, a, a good group and not a waste of my time hopefully yeah. yeah let's talk a little bit about your practice there um you, you're a sports and orthopedic physical therapist do you train or do you sorry do you treat a lot of martial artists I, I do I do I treat a lot of um because I've been around the circle for so long, right? I, I also do normal physical therapy stuff, right? But I have an understanding of the movements of martial arts that I could treat martial arts artists more effectively. For example, I had a, a patient who was a pro boxer and he comes in, he's like, oh, I don't know why I, I uh, my shoulder's hurting here now. And then I asked him what he's been doing. And then I, I, I look at him and I'm like, have you been changing the way you hook? He said, like, oh, how'd you know? Oh, because this is this small muscle here, blah, 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 blah. And this small muscle is involved in this movement. And if you change your hook, the power hits back and it actually jars that muscle. And he, he was quite surprised. I knew that it was because he changed his the way he did his hook. And then uh, so we worked both ways. We changed the practice a bit. And then uh, we also did some physical therapy and some exercise and it helped him greatly. And then also there would be the stuff like back pain from grapplers, right? I mean, nowadays people do a lot of inversions when they do grappling, or it's when you go upside down. Yeah. And sometimes when I mention different styles, uh, the guys are like, oh, how'd you know? I'm like, oh, I do a bit of practice too. 
and and so eventually like word of mouth spreads and i i, I treat a lot of different martial artists yeah that's very helpful that's a so source of frustration for me and a lot of other martial artists i know is that when we do have injuries and we go to the doctor they're just uh almost Stop telling yeah they're yeah exactly don't do that or you know why are you doing that to yourself you know there's not very much understanding at all i'm i'm lucky that i do have one doctor that actually is a um, brazilian jiu-jitsu guy so he at least uh, understands why we do what we do but um you know a lot of the time they they have no no context of how you know an injury takes place or how to treat it for that matter you know other than to tell you to stop brought in the scope to normal sports injuries a lot of the, the normal health care people it's partial everybody understands the biology of sports injuries but it's here that people don't understand if i go to a doctor or a physical therapist and i tell you even with running oh my knees hurt from running and the, the guy tells you oh you know you should stop running I, i'd be like why am i seeing you i i'm seeing you because i want to keep running why should right. you tell me this it's a psychology that people don't get it's it's not hard to fix an injury but it's hard to fix an injury and also get back to practice as well because part of my um uh, professional background is I'm also qualified by the International Olympic Committee for sports ath uh, athletic uh, physical therapy, sports physical therapy. So, so sometimes I work with elite level athletes. I'm I'm actually I might be flying to um, Abu Dhabi in October to um, go with the um, Bulgarian judo team. Wow! Just to be there, uh, yeah, just to be there. It's an honor for me too. Yeah, it's lucky for them too. It sounds like that's great. It's, it's, it'll be interesting. But yeah, so so growing up in Hong Kong, training is different. It's quite different in Hong Kong compared to the West. I've been training in both ways. And and back in, how much time do we have? Uh, We're good. Oh, yeah, a little bit of time. Roll on. <laughs> so I want to mention my other teachers in Hong Kong too. Otherwise, if they watch it, they'll be like, why are you only talking about your scene? <laughs> no, so yeah. Good. Yeah, so so training in Hong Kong was a bit different. It was a lot, very family style based. Uh, what I mean is, um, if I start with my Wing Chun teacher, he is my family, but also the the style back then was very close. Yeah, uh, I, I know a lot of Vietnam students, and um, you, I call them uncles, but not just well, we call them martial uncles, but everybody calls them martial uncles, right? But when you get close to them, they 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 because the the top disciples of every teacher. It's almost like, uh, I wouldn't say a representative, but I would call the uncles a family name. I would call their wives a family name because in, in Chinese, um, you call your relatives a different name depending on where they're at in the hierarchy. And then it's kind of like that. And they would call you up if they have issues. They'd be like, oh, Jaren, uh, which would, is, uh, which would be my, if in a family situation, it would be, my parents older uncle my older brother's wife so we have this like hierarchical naming system right so he would call me he's like oh jaren uh but but i strained her back or something uh, what should we do la 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 la, la. and we, we get that too and um that was it and uh training in hong kong was different because um some of my teachers were were, were very open and some were just like ah, you can't train with anybody else yeah is so so i had to i only started my instagram stuff i only started actually posting martial arts stuff in the past three years or so think about it. i'm 37 now so i didn't start posting stuff until i was in my late 30s because i was worried that i would get like killed if i posted other styles <laughs> yeah yeah but then i i gave up with one uh, i i i was like ah whatever i i should start why not because i was always hoping for uh uh, for one of my teachers to be okay with with me learning other styles, but he is never okay. So so he'll never be okay. So I'll just say, ah, it, whatever. I'll start posting, and 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 so that was that. And um, yeah, so so when I started with learning with my Wing Chun teacher, it was very hands on. Uh, I was a group of say three or four students. I was his first group, and um, I was lucky he would chisa with me because I was young. He also wanted he stopped teaching for thirty years or so. Yeah. And um, he wanted to bring his Kung Fu back. He wanted to get back into shape. He was around 50 then, and we were kids, so there was no way we could beat him up anyways, right? Yeah. So he would train with us every every day, three times a week for about 
two hours and he would nonstop play with us. So we picked up a lot of stuff there. So I was lucky. And, uh, but after that, uh, he has a bit of a temper mm. and, um, and, and, and maybe even less patience than me. So, so when new students came, he'd go, ah, oh, you know, you go train, you go teach. So I started helping out there. Uh, that's, uh, and then, yeah, that's the Wing Chun teacher for you. But I uh, know I want to mention my Tai Chi teacher because he's actually like very, very good to me. We were a very, very close relationship. But I actually picked up a lot of um, practical Tai Chi stuff from him because he's in law enforcement, right? Right. So when we trained, a lot of law enforcement people would come. It was funny because there would be a lot of different styles. And then we would have to try. It was still during the time when I had to fight everybody who came. And so I fought a lot of people with the Wing Chun school and the Tai Chi school. But the most interesting part of the training was when he had like, uh, I think it was a SWAT team or a riot control team around. And he's like, oh, they're training tactics. I'm like, what tactics? I want to learn. What, what? Oh, you know, you go beat the dummy. And so they had these formations. They, they called them like three-man team or the five-man team. And they would try to arrest me uh, under their rules. And I would have to do whatever I can to not get arrested. And it was a very fun time because I would have, I'd be like running around trying to punch and kick everybody. And they'd have three people trying to like, like, like hold me down. And um, they had to use a five-man team for me back then, but most probably because they were following all the rules by the book yeah. <laughs> and they didn't want to kill me. Right. And I got a lot of good training there too. Yeah. But anyways, that was a rant. I, we could keep going. No, that sounds like a lot of fun. So you've had a lot of interesting teachers and interesting experiences. And um, obviously with your background, um, you know, in healing, um, that all ties into it nicely as well. What, what do you think going forward, the future of all these traditional arts is going to be? Where do you see it going in the future? I People start thinking, start to think it's losing value, right? So when I started semi-teaching and opening my own uh posting my own videos i want to think of a school name for me i called it the practical internal martial arts academy and um, actually sibu haiyang uh, did a bit of his writing calligraphy for me in the chinese name it's nice it's on my facebook nice. yeah but i called it practical but mostly because i started off being wanting it to be a practical fighter but i realized the practical use of chinese martial arts isn't limited to fighting so right. it I, my academy or, or my mindset is it's practical in the sense of martial arts application of preserving and promoting health and also preserving and promoting culture because it's a very practical way to put all these things together. So there's a bit of it for everyone. So if you want to go in just to move around, it's there. If you go into fight, it's there. Uh, honestly speaking, we all know that it it's, will never be as good as a professional fighter. And fighting because it's a different type of training right but it's it's the practical use is still there uh, and then the, it's also a practical way of um of preserving culture because through it you learn a lot of different things like for example like the family style stuff you wouldn't know unless you were if as a westerner you would never learn about it unless you were in chinese martial arts you wouldn't know how to address say how we addressed our, our family and how some of them could smack you in the face and you can't say anything about it and, <laughs> and stuff like that so it's it's uh uh yeah, that's 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 a direction. So it's a multifaceted system where you could pick things out that you liked, and it, that there would always be a bit of it in there. And that's how we get preserved moving forward. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And and that that even goes back to you know um, we talked earlier about you know when you're young you want that practical martial art and you know it means something to you. When you're 18, you think oh that means I can beat somebody in a fight, but then. As you get older, you realize how practical it is for your self-preservation, keeping yourself healthy, keeping yourself moving, keeping yourself engaged. Yeah, mental. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jaren, we're just about out of time. Um, would you like to tell people where they can find you if they're interested? Or is that a secret? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm mostly active on Instagram and Facebook. I have an account. Uh, I call myself the Kung Fu Ronin. So, cause I'm all over the place, right? So, uh, yeah. So you could, if you just search for it on Instagram or YouTube, I recently started a YouTube channel. Oh, great. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I put some stuff on, it'll mostly be, uh, uh, tutorials, techniques, and I might do some talks as well, uh, just to talk about different interesting topics and see, see if, if the people like it.
So it's the, it's Kung Fu Ronin on all across all platforms. It's fantastic. I hope people will look for that. And of course, uh, we're hoping that they'll find you here on uh, Dowie as well in the near future. So look forward to some interviews. Thanks for taking time out to talk with me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.